we talk about now Ezekiel the heavens are opening and now he's going to see visions of God this is a divine thing this is a supernatural thing it is a Holy Spirit enabled thing it is not something anyone on this earth and I say this with 100% confidence this is not something that anybody on planet earth is going to see before the rapture okay not going to happen you have to read them so you see it Check your medication, okay? <laughs> All right. I've already took my medication. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, so uh, just know that. That's not me being mean. It's just understanding the division of Scripture, how this thing works. Now, um, so let's read Ezekiel 1, 4, 5 again just to refresh before the break. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. Because that's because God, in God, He is, he is light, and in Him is no variableness or shadow of turning. And it says here, a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now, as we're going to see, God is never alone. He is since creation. God is never alone in His heavenly court, but He has, for, for lack of a better term here, He has attendants. Okay? Um, and it's these living creatures. Now, this is where, when I first started studying Ezekiel, I wanted to just read through it, and I, I hit those verses, and I thought, oh, goodness. What did I give myself? I don't know what these things are. I don't even know what to call them. Well, guess what? I don't have to be that smart because the Bible tells me. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 10. Ezekiel chapter 10. <laughs> yeah, you just, hey, Brian's coming to say, what the world's Greg going to say about this? <laughs> well, I haven't got, got through it, but I started reading it and I'm like, uh, yeah, this is going to be good. I wouldn't call it good just yet. <laughs> you preserve that. It's going to be new. It's going to be new. There you go. It's going to be different. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 10. Look with me at verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims there appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Now, Say, so, okay, Gary, how does that explain what those living creatures are? Well, they are cherubims. Here's how I know. Come on down to verse 15. And the cherubims were lifted up. This is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kabar. Yeah, when you come back to Ezekiel 1, where was Ezekiel when he got this first vision? By the river Kabar. So these creatures are cherubims. These are a highly specialized angel. Every angel is not created the same. They are a created being. They do have a created order and hierarchy. We do not have time to get into Angelology 101. Okay? Just take my word for that. You can go do some study on your own if that really interests you. I do want to just make a very quick side note. Nobody here has a guardian angel. I want to make a second side note here. Nobody dies and becomes an angel. Okay, I'm not trying to be mean, but y'all, let's be biblical. Okay, let's be truthful and honest about what the Bible does say. And let's not mislead people. In fact, if you die and become an angel, that means God has demoted you. Okay, you are the body of Christ and you are above all principality and power. Okay, so to become an angel is to be a demoted individual in heaven. That's, that's not something to look forward to. Okay? And so, um, these are a highly specialized creature. And so, it, it's a common occurrence to have these cherubim um, in His presence, especially. Now, what we're going to see, there's a pattern sort of in the Old Testament that when God reveals Himself in His fiery glory, it's commonplace that these cherubim are present. They are His court. They are His... They're, it's kind of like secret service around the president. Okay? And so He's always got these guys. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Again, this is sort of like cross-reference material, if you will. 
Isaiah chapter 66. It's the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. Praise the Lord, I didn't choose Isaiah. 66 chapters. I got 48 chapters in Ezekiel. So I'm look, I'm getting a break. Isaiah 66. Is that uh, left or right? It's to the left, Rita. Take a left turn from Ezekiel, go to Isaiah. That same thing happens. I get so turned around sometimes. Nahum in a minute. It's going to take us 30 minutes to find that little stinker. Uh, Isaiah chapter 66. Verse 15. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with His chariots like a whirlwind to render His anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. So, when God shows up and wants people to see Him, usually something ain't just right. Okay? He is revealing. When He reveals His glory, it's not like He's trying to be a meanie or a bully. He's trying to establish there's one. I am God. Okay? And he does that with remarkable clarity. Uh, go with me, take a right turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. Notice, we just turned from there, but in that Isaiah 66, he shows up in the whirlwind. So there's some commonality there with the Ezekiel account. It also talked about these chariots. Okay, remember that. Because in a minute, we're going to see wheels and wheels and craziness. Just remember chariots. Okay. Um, Jeremiah chapter 4. Look with me at verse 13. Behold, he shall come up as clouds, and his chariots shall be as a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe unto us, for we are spoiled. Again, there's this, there's this Old Testament notion, there's a pattern that when fury is revealed, it's a whirlwind, it's a, it's a force. And these chariots are, in, in the Old Testament mind, are things of force and of power and even of a crushing nature. Okay, And so there's a sense, there's an artistry to the prophecy that you read in Ezekiel that's trying to convey not just the words on the page, but the, the sense of this vision, the awesomeness of it. Okay, um, It is it's trying to elicit weak needs. Okay? Um, and so, there, again, there's this pattern. Now, y'all find Nahum. Let me show you how you do it. Let me show you how you do it. Go to the front of your Bible. There's a table of contents. Good. Or ask Emma. Mine don't have a table of contents. I just there it is. And and you find that little thing called N A H U M. All right. And then you turn to that page number. Mine is nine fifty two. It's the same in yours, Miss Mildred, because me and you got the same Bible. Go to Nahum. Some say Nahum. I don't know how you say it. So I call it Nahum. You call what you want to. Nahum chapter 1. And look with me starting in verse 1. This is the prophet Nahum. God speaking through this prophet. And he says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite, God is jealous. And the Lord revengeth. Here's what that means. When God's in love with something, He will fight tooth and nail for it. Man, this ought to make us feel so good. I, you know, Israel, I know we like to point the finger at them sometimes and go, what were y'all thinking? Well, listen, they're fallen. They're broken just like we are. They make dumb decisions just like we do. And then we look at it and we read the history book here and we go, man... What dummies? Well, no, don't point that finger. Don't point that finger because we, we fall into the same situation. But God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on His adversaries and He reserveth wrath for His enemies. That's really important there. 
The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath His way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of His feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dryeth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. He means business. Okay? And so, throughout Ezekiel's prophecy, God really, He is very bright. He's red hot. I don't know about y'all's daddy. My daddy, when he'd get mad, I could tell him. His face would get red. And I was like, man, you can't hide that dude's going to find you and destroy you with that belt, you better, whoo, you better straighten up, boy. And so God's revealing himself to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel's looking at him, and he's like, Amber alert, Amber alert, he's red hot, he's on fire, okay? And it's because he's furious. Because he's jealous for his people. It's like somebody comes in the middle of the night and kidnaps one of your children out of your house. Son, let me tell you, you're going to be on fire. Not going to be a happy sight for your adversary. Okay? I got another thing coming. And so what we're going to see throughout Ezekiel is that God expresses the reason for the punishment that He has caused to befall all of Israel. The northern tribes have been you know, cast away by Assyria. Now the southern tribes by Babylon. So the whole nation is in shambles. Been taken over by these heathen Gentiles. Okay? Now watch this. Come back with me to Ezekiel. Take a left turn from that. Go back to Ezekiel and go to chapter 5. Here's, here's God's going to tell us the reason for the punishments that He has caused on His beloved people. And here it is, uh, Ezekiel 5, verse 13. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished, and I will cause my fury to rest upon them, and I will be comforted, and they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal, when I have accomplished my fury in them. Now let me ask you, is that because God just needs to pitch a fit? Yeah, remember what we talked about last week? God is not pleased with an end game of death. That's what the Calvinists teach. The book of Ezekiel does not teach that. The book of Ezekiel, especially when you get down to chapter 33, God cries out to His people. He says, turn, turn. Why won't you turn? Why do you choose death over this loving relationship and the privilege and the power that I'm freely giving to you? Under the dispensation of the grace of God today, God is calling out to a lost and dying world. And He says, why will you choose death why will you not take what I am freely giving you? And what does Paul tell us in Romans 11? If you don't take advantage of it, at some point, he will cut you off that olive tree just as fast as he did Israel in the past. Take full advantage of the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, I want to pause here. Because we need to make some really important application. You know, for Israel, they did. They had it tough. Because the conditions of the law that they agreed to is that if they didn't do what God asked them to do, then God was going to discipline them. He was going to punish them. And His punishment was going to be severe. And as God Himself just said, nobody can stand up against it. So, ugh, rough. And I want, I want to pause here and make a dispensational distinctive. We are not under the dispensational law. We are not Israel in time past. 
Today, you and I believers, we are the church, the body of Christ, under the dispensation of the grace of God. A different policy system, a different set of terms than what they had back there. Now, here's why that's good news. Today, the body of Christ has a different relationship with God than Israel did when she sinned. What happens with your relationship with God today as a member of the body of Christ when you sin? Now this is huge. This is so life-altering. This is so liberating. This is so joy-giving. And the church today is missing. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Church, here's, here's what happens. Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have, we possess, we own, never to be released from, absolutely anchored in, rooted in, grounded in, what? Peace <coughs> with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you get to 1 Timothy, back up a couple. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians. Yeah, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What did I say? Did I say something different? Timothy. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. If you get to Timothy, back up a couple. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look with me at verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. You have to ask yourself, who is the us there? It is only those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you are in Christ Jesus, you have peace with God. Here's what that means. When you sin, God doesn't blast you with His anger. Isn't that crazy, Rita? It is. That's hard to believe. I'm about to sit standing here as a man. That's hard for me to believe. I have been so reared and raised up in the law. God does this, and if you don't confess your sins and understand that He's faithful and just forgives for sins and cleanse from all life, then you're, you just you never just have favor with God, right? That's not what the Bible teaches when you rightly divide. When you rightly divide, let me tell you something. You're free from sin. You're free from guilt. You're free from shame. You're free from wrath. You are free from condemnation. Yeah. Doggone it. Stand up and live it. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is the beauty of it. How in the world? Why don't we get punished for our sins today like Israel did in the past? Why isn't, why isn't God casting us off some island or something without food or water or something like that just to punish us? Because we just can't seem to get right. Why not? I'm glad you asked. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Take a left turn from where you are. Right before the book of Galatians. Go to 2 Corinthians. Go with me to chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Here, here's why you as a member of the body of Christ don't get punished for your sin today. And it's because of what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For He, God, hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Here's why. Because God murdered all of your sin on the cross before you were born. 
So any sin that may come out of you is already done. All of his anger was already accomplished for that sin. He already got mad about it, and then he built a bridge and got over it. Aren't you glad, Rita? You got me crying, Dad Gummy. <laughs> so, Romans 8. I'm telling y'all, Ezekiel will preach. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you are in Christ, you're walking after the Spirit. We covered that ground back when we were doing our study of Romans. You have to go back and watch the videos on YouTube. I ain't got time to get back into it again. That's not a works-based kind of salvation. That's not what he's talking about. Let me tell you, this is good news, y'all. And we study the book of Ezekiel. Man, we need to be thanking the Lord God Almighty that He has enacted grace as a system of dealing with humanity today. And I'm going to tell you, we got some real privilege. That's what we've got. Hallelujah. Praise God for it. Alright, back to Ezekiel. Verse 5 again. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Alright. Um, to be honest, I have no clue what these creatures look like. Brian, I'm sorry. You came here today thinking, yes! Greg is going to paint a picture for me. He's going to draw something and it's going to go, bing! <laughs> okay? Not going to happen. Why don't you bring um, the whiteboard then? What's that? Why don't you bring the whiteboard then? Well, because I'm going to draw something here in a minute. All right? Let's keep reading though. Verse 5. Uh, it says, Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Now, I want you to imagine that you're in my position today, and you've got to tell all y'all what these things look like. All right, so let's read, because, you know, the Bible gives you the descriptions of dog How come y'all can't figure it out? <laughs> Verse 6. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they uh, sparkled like the color of burnished brass. Uh, and don't you know when they come charging in, it sounds kind of terrifying. I mean, you know. Um, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went every one straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion. On the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another and two covered their bodies and they went every one straight forward. Whither the spirit was to go, they went and they turned not when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. It went up and down among the living creatures and the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning and the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. Can't outrun them. All right. I don't know what they look like. I can draw. I can do art. I'm sort of imaginative. Rita, you're an artist. I've seen your sculptures. Very imaginative. Do you have a clue what these things look like? All right, there's a reason why you and I don't. Again, this goes back to a program issue. There were men in the nation of Israel in the past that God specifically gave a gift of craftsmanship and artistry that understood these descriptions because it was their duty to craft certain things for Israel so they understood. We do not have those things. Okay? Now, watch this. Y'all go back with me to Exodus chapter 25. <coughs> <coughs> Exodus 
Exodus chapter 25, begin reading in verse uh, 18. God is expressing to Moses all this tabernacle equipment. Okay? And then God's going to use certain people to build this stuff. Because Moses is not the, he's not the craftsman. He's just the messenger. Okay? Exodus chapter 25. Uh, drop down with me to verse 18. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work, shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I, I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment uh, unto the children of Israel. The ark of the covenant does not exist today. I know that you've seen artistic renderings. You've seen scientists dig up stuff out of the dirt. You haven't seen these things. Okay? I do want you to take note, however, that if God's going to show up, He's going to have His dudes with Him. <laughs> and that's these cherubim. Alright? Um, it's a big deal. Uh, now, go with me to chapter 36. Chapter 36 of the Exodus. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 36. Exodus chapter 36, verse 8. And every wise-hearted man among them that wrought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work made he them. These were wise-hearted men. Now read this kind of gets back to some of your questions about prophets. Did they just choose to be this? Or did this God select them? I think this is an issue where God gives them ability. Okay? And here's why. Go with me to chapter 37. We'll, we'll see one of these wise-hearted men. Start in verse 1. Exodus chapter 37, verse 1. And Bezalel made the ark of Shittim wood. Two cubits and a half was the length of it, and a cubit and a half the breadth of it, and a cubit and a half the height of it. And he overlaid it with pure gold within and without, and made a crown of gold to, uh, to it round about. And he cast for it four rings of gold. That's really interesting commentary and cross-reference material. Rings are a lot like wheels. <clears throat> uh, anyway... Uh, even two rings upon the one side of it and two rings upon the other side of it. And he made staves of shatim wood and overlaid them with gold. And he put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark to bear the ark. And he made the mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half was the length thereof and one cubit and a half the breadth thereof. And he made two cherubims of gold beaten out of the one piece. Made he them on the two ends of the mercy seat. One cherub on one end side and another cherub on the other end. And on that side out of the mercy seat made he the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubims spread out their wings on high and covered with their wings over the mercy seat with their faces one to another. Even to the mercy seat word uh, were the faces of the cherubims. Now, um, again... These aren't just your everyday artists, okay? You've got to also remember, this is again a part, this is where right division makes a big difference. This is again a part of God's ministry with the nation Israel, um, the giftedness that they had. This is not something you and I did. Now, I promise you, y'all get on Dr. Google. If Dr. Google, Google will give you all kinds of interpretations of what these things look like, okay? I'm going to just go out on a limb and say, swing and a miss. Okay, so I do know this. These things are wild. You don't mess with them. And I don't think there's anything on this earth that looks anything remotely close to these things. Have y'all seen any lately? Anything like it? Okay, so um, these things are different. So, um, again, part of the... the, the, the Responsibility of this chairman is to carry the throne of God and it's their responsibility to escort him wherever he is. Go with me to Psalm 18. It's in the middle of your Bible. Psalm 18. Psalm 
In the Psalm 18, um, David's talking about God Himself, and he says in verse 10, Psalm 18, verse 10, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yes, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. It's it's interesting. Every, everywhere these things go, well, it's just a whirlwind. It is just a woof. Um, you see that throughout. Go with me. Take, take a left turn. Go back to 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Man, there's no way. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Yo, know, it always takes me a few weeks to get into the rhythm of a book study and know how much material to prepare from week to week. This is the impossible mission. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Come with me to verse 7. 2 Samuel 22 verse 7. In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And He did hear my voice out of His temple. And my cry did enter into His ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because He was wroth. There went up a smoke out of His nostrils and fire out of His uh, mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed uh, the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before, uh, yeah, through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Uh, go with me to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. Look with me at verse 6. It's interesting, throughout the timeline, these men, Ezekiel and Samuel and John the Revelator, these are massively different periods of time. I mean, they're separated by centuries and centuries, and yet they all get these visions up into heaven and they see the same thing. It's, it's amazing to me. Uh, there's really only one explanation for that. There's a common source of the information they're getting. I mean, so anyway, Revelation uh, chapter 4, look at, uh, with me at verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eel. The reason why John saw four beasts that look like four different things, remember, each one has four faces. And depending on their position on the four corners of the chariot, they're rotated differently. So from one perspective, one vantage point, one looks like an eagle, one looks like a man, one looks like a calf or an ox, and the other looks like a lion. If he moved over here, the one that looked like a lion doesn't look like a man because they're four-faced. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not different accounts. It's just perspective. All right. Um, so, let's look at these cherubs. Come all the way back with me to Ezekiel 1. I'm not going to read each of these. I want you to just make note, if you will, because I'm, I'm pressed for time here. In verse 5, one of the things we learn about these cherubim is their main body structure is man-like in form. I already explained it to you. Head, body that's upright, arms, legs. Okay? Verse 6, we find out that they are four-faced. So that means you have four creatures. Each creature has four faces. Not four separate heads on one creature. One head, because he's man-like, with four faces on that one head. Again, if your brain can make that image, you got the gift of artistry. <laughs> I don't. All right, uh, not like that. Now, not only does each have four faces, each one cherubim has four wings. Now, what's interesting about this, when you get over into other prophets, they'll explain them as having six wings. I don't know the discrepancy there. I don't understand it yet. Okay, so I don't know. That's the answer. All right. I know they at least have four wings. One was a butterfly and one was a dragonfly. <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. Uh, and so, that's what's going on there. Now, third thing to find out, and this is from verse 7 there, 
is that their lower legs, say from like example, their knees downward look like a calf's. Um, they got hooves, but they're they're like polished brass. So when they come running, by the way, it's like because it's lightning. The sound that these creatures have to make when they y'all lightning makes a boom. These things move like lightning with brass calf feet. If they come up instantly and get in your face, you're going to see them first because the light's going to get to you first. And then the sonic boom is going to hit you. You know what's going to happen next? You're going to pee in your pants. Alright, <laughs> verse 8. Here's what verse 8 tells us. For each face or side of each cherub there were two hands now this is interesting they only have each one only has a total of two hands but they're useful on all four sides my I, so their jointedness apparently is able to do things that our human joints don't do. Okay? This would be like if I had a face back here and all of a sudden I could use my hands in the same way that I would use them out here. The joints have to work differently. Okay? I don't know what was funny about that. But anyway. Alright, so that's what's going on. Um... Now, the next thing we learn, and we learn this, look with me at verse 9. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. And then look down at verse 12. And they went everyone straight forward. Whether the Spirit was to go, they went. And they turned not when they went. Go with me to chapter 10 fast. Chapter 10. Uh, verse 8. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. And as for their appearances, uh, they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the uh, place where the head looked. They followed it. They turned not as they went. Here's... So... Here's the reason why they never have to turn. They're always facing where they want to go. Because they have four faces. If I have a face here and I go this way, guess what? I don't have to turn. If I have a face back here, guess what? I go that way and I don't have to turn. I don't know what that looks like. But that's their capacity. That's their ability. Alright? Now in verse 10 we find out that each face had a different look. Face of a man, face of a lion, face of an ox, face of an eagle. You're going to pick up commentaries. Here's what they're going to tell you. The face of a man symbolizes intelligence, like human intelligence. The face of a lion is about fierceness and royalty. They're going to say the face of an ox is about steadfastness and hard work and stability. And they're going to tell you the face of an eagle is like swiftness. And you know what i tell you about that? Great, grand, and wonderful. You just can't support it with the Bible. They just are what they are. You can make up whatever you want to about that, but I'm just telling you that the Bible does not interpret those as symbolic of something for us. We have to sort of speculate, okay? What was his purpose for seeing these? I'm sorry? What was the purpose for him seeing these? Well, as I mentioned... Mean, was was God telling him something? Was he telling... Him? Or giving him a message to give to people. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this, not to belittle what he saw, please understand this. I think it was it was a parade of power just to knock him on his knees. For him specifically. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And as we see in Isaiah, Isaiah talks about quick understanding. <laughs> Ezekiel, in a matter of Two milliseconds went, oh, <laughs> got it. Point taken. Okay? God is an effective communicator that way. And this is before we even see God Himself. These are the heralds. 
And so, you better wake up, dude. All right? Now, verse 11 tells us that this type of angel can fly. Not all angels can fly. They can move quickly, but not all can fly. So, the little fat, naked angels in the clouds shooting bows and arrows with little wings, not them. Verse 12 tells us, they are driven, if you will, by the Spirit, precisely and decisively. Because the Spirit of God never goes, what, uh, let me, uh, it's not that. It, boom, wake up, Beverly. <laughs> okay. Never second guess. It is always exact. Verse 13 tells us that they're very bright. <laughs> and then verse 14, uh, they were instant and accurate with their movement. Now, come with me to Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 15. I have three minutes. No way. Verse 15, Ezekiel 1, verse 15. Now, as I beheld the living creatures, behold, one will upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of a barrel. And they four had one likeness in their appearance, and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and their rings were full of eyes round about them four. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go. And the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And those were lifted up from the earth. The wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. We also find out later on in uh, other portions of Ezekiel, around about chapter 10, these things start to be likened to a chariot wheel, okay? And they have eyes all in them, and they got all this imagery on them. All right, here's where the drawing fun begins. Okay, these wheels have four faces. How does a wheel have four faces? And then we'll get to the wheel inside of them, okay? So, I'm going to try to do this in 3D the best I can. It's like a tire on your car, right? All right. Uh, hold on. Y'all see that? Y'all ready to count the faces? Outside face, number one. This is my interpretation. Brian, I hope you're liking this. <laughs> Took me months. I like a drawing. Took months. <laughs> face number two. The inner face. Face number three. The side wall. <laughs> Back in the day we had white walls. Where's the fourth face? Inside side wall. Okay. Now. The wheel inside of a wheel. What we would call the hub. Now, in depictions of early antiquity from the, you know, 700, 800 BC era, chariots, some would have one axle, some would have two axles, by the way. Okay, so some of them were dualies because <laughs> they would carry more men, some would carry only one individual. But you would have a hub in the middle. And it was similar in that, you know, it, it had a had four faces as well. And then it was upon that that you would have basically like an axle. And then over here, you know, you got the one on the other side. And this thing carried, you know, your chariot, right? And it's inside that chariot, you got these dudes. Now, here's the thing. These cherub, you had a cherubim over each wheel. Okay? And so, they were, you know, if you, if you, if you ever study like the locomo modern locomotive trains, they have these massive diesel engines. The diesel engine is just a generator. It generates electricity. And then what you have at each wheel is an electric motor. So the diesel engine generates the electricity that drives the electric motor that drives the wheel. Well, the cherubim are like, this is a four-wheel drive machine. 
Okay, that's carrying something very special. So over each wheel, powering each wheel is a cherub. And oh, by the way, they got a lot of horsepower. And they are like zero to 60, and you can't count that fast, okay? And so super duper fast. So I believe what's going on here, what, what is Zeke, this is commentary, so it's not authoritative. I'm doing the best I can. I believe what Ezekiel is seeing here is the chariot of God holding the throne of God. You're welcome to disagree. You're welcome to challenge. You're not going to hurt my feelings whatsoever. <coughs> now read them. This one's for you. I'm just going to go over time. So I thought, well, I'll try to be smart about this thing. But every time I started drawing stuff, I go, I don't know if that's right. I'm still not completely sold on that. But I started thinking, well, you got a wheel, you know, with a four side, blah, 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 all that stuff. And then a wheel inside of a wheel, because I started thinking like the Ark of the Covenant, you had rings on the four corners, and then you had the staves that go through there, and they would pick it up, and that's how they would carry the thing. So I thought, well, maybe the second wheel was like this, you know, loop, and then you've got the cherubim that would hang on to the loop, and they would carry it. And it would just roll because it's going. It can go straight in any direction. Did it say anything about the wheel uh, turning or levitating? See, that's the problem. That's the problem right there. See, see. So that don't work, does it? Because you got to turn in things to make it go in any direction. Because the angels, they just go. It doesn't matter. Well, that wheel, and, 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 and that's it. It don't end, end this way. So, in my genius. Mind, I thought, I can outsmart this. <laughs> so I thought, okay, maybe the first wheel, so to speak, is on its side. And it's like a bearing, a ball bearing. Okay? And then you've got a wheel inside of it, almost like a sphere, right? And that one now. It can go anywhere you want it to. In any direction. Yeah. That one fails too. Okay? So, your guess is as good as mine. Y'all remember where I started this thing? I said, I don't know what they look like. Y'all have seen the extent of my creativity. That is it. I know, Karen, it's laughable. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> Won't you do better? Okay? And so, that's all I got. Again, here's the thing. you got to remember, the heavens opened here. Not MIT School of Engineering, because that's a puny. This is God engineering. And oh, by the way, it doesn't have to obey the laws of earthly physics. This is heavenly. We already learned all this stuff back when we talked about the New Jerusalem. That thing, no. We, we, we just can't make that work. You know? It could that be like balls. I'm sorry? It could be like a ball. Remember, what was the toy we had that you could go anywhere you wanted it? Here's a linguistic problem I have with that. The Bible is perfectly comfortable using the word sphere or circle. It never uses that here. Right. Hmm. He uses the word wheel. Here's another problem. You get over in Ezekiel chapter 10, and it talks about these wheels having four faces with four images on them. One a lion, one an ox, one a man, and one... So, here's my genius again. Are y'all ready? So you got this wheel. Y'all can remember like in the Middle Ages when you watch TV shows from like, you know, when the knights and all that stuff, and they would have a wheel, you know... And the way they would kind of build these things is like you would you would almost have like your hub in the middle and a spoke and a spoke and a spoke and a spoke. And then they would kind of build it like this. Uh, and you would have a man and a lion and an ox and an eagle. I don't have a clue. It's like a drone. The wheels are flat. No, see, like see, I know. I see all this tech, techie geeks. 
We think we like to think, oh, this is a helicopter because they talk about two wings and <laughs> making all this noise, right? Bananas. <laughs> this is heavenly. And, and they're southern boys because it's four over there. Yeah, and everybody knows that drones don't last long because that thing it touches one time and the wings go. <laughs> this don't. That's not. A, it's not. Not that. But it doesn't have to turn. It does. It doesn't have to turn. So anyway. Y'all cool with that? Good. All right, moving on. Um, again, I gotta go. I just I got to get through chapter one. So I'm sorry we're over time. If you gotta get take a break real quick, just go. Okay. If you got appointments, you gotta get to. I understand. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. I gotta get through this. So let me just roll on. Um, I think again these these things are wheels are a part of a chariot like structure. It may not look in, you know, like what we would consider to be a chariot because, again, this is heavenly engineering. Um, but anyway, it is what it is. Now, watch this. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 7. 1 Kings chapter 7. The quicker you get there, the quicker you get out of here. 1 Kings chapter 7. Look with me at verse 30. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 30. And every base, again, talking about Solomon's temple and all the stuff that's in there for the ministering to the saints and all this stuff. Verse 30, And every base had four brazen wheels and plates of brass, and the four corners thereof had undersetters. Under the laver were undersetters molten at the side of every addition, and the mouth of it within the cha uh, chapter and above was a cubit, but the mouth thereof was round after the work of the base, a cubit and a half, and also upon the mouth of it were engravings with their borders four square, not round, and under the borders were four wheels. And the uh, axle trees of the wheels were joined to the base, and the height of the wheel of a wheel was a cubit and a half, and, and on and on it goes. There are times in the Old Testament when it talks about wheels, it talks about like wheels of a chariot. There's other times in the Bible when the Bible talks about a wheel, it talks about it in the sense of a grinding or a millstone. What chapter are you in? That was 1 Kings chapter 7. I'm sorry, I told you I'm going fast. All right, so now think about a millstone because here's what happens these cherubim, they, they, they descend down onto the earth, they're carrying the throne, and when they come, they come to, with fury. And y'all know what millstones do they crush, they grind. Okay, just keep that image in mind and go with me to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. This is 100% Greg commentary right now. I didn't study one commentary for this little portion that we're talking about right now. So if it's off, it's off, y'all. I'm doing the best I can with the Bible. Okay, Proverbs chapter 20. Again, this idea of a millstone. The, the chariot and wheel, much like a millstone, was, was viewed, especially in the Old Testament, as a powerful force. Think about those Egyptians when they're charging up behind the nation of Israel and they're coming out of captivity across the Red Sea. It's a thing of fury. Because they're thinking, Israel's thinking, we're about to be dust. We're going to be tread under by these horses and these chariots. Okay? And just, they're going to smear us. Proverbs chapter 20. This is interesting language. Verse 26. Proverbs 20, verse 26. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the will over them. Let's think about Israel history. <clears throat> Israel time and again messed up under all these kings. Remember we looked at those kings last week? Finally Manasseh comes along and he really does them in. So by the time we get to Jehoiakim, God says, I'm raising up Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians and I'm going to send them to scatter you. Why? <coughs> These are God's people. But because of their sin, because of their rebellion, they are wicked. So God is going to, with the will, scatter them. A lot of this imagery that Ezekiel is seeing now is in part an explanation not only of the power and authority of God, but the very reason and the heart behind the scattering that has now come upon them because of their sin. And this, I believe, in the Old Testament mind of Ezekiel made a lot of sense. Like, this is serious business. We're being crushed. We're being scattered by the kings of the earth. 
Okay, and so I think that's why you get a lot of this imagery of the wheels and that kind of stuff. So what this vision expresses is the power of God's fury on the earth concerning Israel's sin. And oh, by the way, for rightly dividers, remember, God's program for Israel always concerns the earth, whereas the body of Christ is all heaven. Okay, and so that's why you see these cherubim come down on the earth, working their stuff on the earth, and then they go back up. Because God's doing something with Israel. On the earth, okay. <clears throat> now the cherubim and their chariot wheels are the, the platform upon which the very heavenly throne of God rests. So come back with me to Ezekiel one. We are going to finish chapter one. Last few verses of, of Ezekiel chapter uh, one. Ezekiel chapter one, verse twenty-two. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal. And by the way, when the Bible uses the word firmament. You've got to look contextually and figure out what that firmament is. Sometimes it talks about the firmament in the sense of the heavens or heaven proper. Sometimes, as is in the case here, a firmament is an actual physical thing. It is truly a firm I mean, Okay? And so it's, it's a real deal thing. And it says, under, And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered on this side, and everyone had two which covered on that side their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like a helicopter, like the noise of great, uh, like a big old drone. And it says, uh, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings, and when there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads, when they stood and had let down their wings... And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. Remember this. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as a color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the appearance of the bow. That is in the cloud in the day of, uh, of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Not the glory of the gaze. Amen. Give us a rainbow back. I think that's going to be the title today. Get off my rainbow. This was the appearance of the likeness of the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. All right, we're charging to the end of chapter 1. Interesting. So I had to look this up because I know nothing about sapphires. Okay. Um, sapphires can actually be many colors. A lot of people think of sapphires as sort of this royal blue color. Uh, it has to do with the amount of iron content in the, in the gemstone depends on the, the color of the stone. Mm -hmm. The purest and most precious of the sapphires are actually pink. Okay? But they can be all sorts of colors. Um, they are a precious stone that is in the, the level of hardness is number two on the list after diamonds. <coughs> okay? And so, um, what happens here, what is astonishing about these, these very costly, precious stones. Now, y'all get this. You can look up some of these sapphires, some of the most precious ones that humans have been able to mine and find on planet Earth. And they're worth millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Okay. Here's what's beautiful about this thing. In the heavenly realm, God uses sapphires for building materials. Two by fours. Pavement. Foundation stones. Footers down in the dirt. Cotton. Exodus chapter 24. <laughs> I'm sorry, I know we're over time. I just, I got to finish here. Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. Exodus chapter 24, verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work, a firmament under his feet of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. 
So, the doormat for God is a sapphire. Go with me to Revelation 21. <coughs> We're going from one end to the other. This Bible, I tell you. Uh, Revelation 21. Look with me at verse 19. Revelation chapter 21, verse 19. And the foundations of the wall of the city. He's speaking here of the bride of Christ which is not the church, which is not Israel. It is, in fact, if you read back earlier in the chapter, it is the New Jerusalem. And so it is this city, the New Jerusalem, that the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. The second? Sapphire. Sapphire. The third? A chalcedony. I don't know how to pronounce it. The fourth an emerald. And on and on we go. These are just mere building materials to God Almighty. Now, you know why there's a rainbow around the throne? Y'all ever seen light pass through a diamond or pass through a sapphire or pass through a precious stone? You know what happens? These precious stones have the remarkable capacity by God's design to separate colors from light. We see light as white, but light is actually a culmination of all of co these colors that God has created. And what happens, the reason why in a rainstorm you will see a rainbow is because the light of the water acts like a prism. And when white light passes through it, it scatters all the light into its separate parts. Now, the, the human eye can only see a certain amount of that spectrum. In heaven, however, in our heavenly bodies that we, the church body of Christ, will get, oh my goodness. Oh, these gays, they think they got a wonderful rainbow, huh? They hadn't seen it all. We get to reserve that beauty. That's ours. Amen? That's awesome. Okay? A lot of things. Come back to Ezekiel 1, verse 23. Real quick. Quick, quick, quick. Quick, quick, quick. And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side of their bodies. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host. When they stood, they let down their wings. Uh, Real quick, I went, one of the last times I went hunting, this is back when I was in, in junior college. I was out, y'all went out on this deer stand. I sat up there all day and the owl started roosting over me, spooked me to death, kept staring at me. I thought I'm scared to death. So I got down from my stand and I got my gun, like picture Elmer Foot. And I'm walking out of the woods, it's dark. And I start to walk through this thicket of like, you know, underbrush. And I was like, one dove. I spooked one dove, and that joker jumped up out of the weeds and started flying and flapping his wings. It scared the mess out of me, y'all. Y'all know what happened? I peed my pants. No, I didn't really. But I'm going to tell you, that little old bitty bird and those little old bitty wings made such a racket, it scared the daylights out of me. These things, when their wings flap, it is a thunder. And by the way, they move at the speed of light. The noise and the boom of these things is so awe-inspiring. There's no way you're just going to stand there and go, Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it's going to make you fall to your knees and pee your pants. Okay? That is what is going to happen. Um, the, the, the voice of God, though, is unmatched. We don't have to, you can write it down. This is just a cross reference. Psalm 29, verses 3 through 8. David speaks very specifically about the voice of God. It is a thundering thing. It shakes the mountains. It melts and does all this. The, the voice of God is unmatched. Don't try to think of James Earl Jones or somebody like that. It does not match. It does not compare because, oh, by the way, it, it's like a chorus of voices, all perfectly tuned, all perfect harmony, and it is such an incredible, powerful, amplified sound. There's no way you can recreate it on this earth with anything that you can come up with. Not happening. Period. Okay. And so then finally, verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And this is what I hymned on. Notice what happened to Ezekiel when he saw this. What happened? In an instant, he fell. He didn't have an option. Terrified him. It terrified him. Go back with me to Isaiah. I want y'all to notice this. A little pattern here. I've got one, two, three verses left. Isaiah. Turn quick. That's a left turn from uh, Ezekiel. Isaiah chapter 6. 
verse 1. In the year uh, that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting up on a throne high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. So, so Isaiah is seeing God Almighty. Above it stood the seraphims. That's different than cherubims. Okay, uh, Each one uh, had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Whoa. <coughs> what happens to Isaiah's posture in the presence of God Almighty when he sees God in his full glory? <laughs> he pees his pants, he drops to his knees. That's the other title. Pee your pants. Okay. Then go to Job. Take a left turn. Job, chapter 42. I'm making a point here, driving a point, and I want to leave you with a thought. Job is right before Psalms. Job 42, right towards the end. Job 42, look with me. And, and y'all know at the end of Job, God is now, He's turned His attention to Job. And he's going to talk directly to Job. And so Job is like, He's catching it. And God even tells him, gird up your loins and stand there like a man. I want you to answer. And then all of a sudden He sees God. And I was like, how am I going to stand? His knees are knocking, you know. He was pants. <laughs> Job 42, uh, verse 1. Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understand not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. Back in the day when they would repent in dust and ashes, they would literally fall down on the ground and cover themselves in dirt and ashes. That's what happens. You ain't got any option. And then one final one, and boy is this one important to us. Go with me to Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> Y'all have been troopers today. Thank you for going on this marathon. And I'm still not caught up with the time. Acts chapter 9, look with me at verse 3. Acts chapter 9, verse 3. And as he journeyed, that is Saul of Tarsus, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, y'all see how quick he understood? What wilt thou have me to do? Let me ask you a question. This is a simple question. What is your response to God? Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you that we've had a chance to and, and hurriedly go through this. But God, there's so much here when we start to entertain your glory, your power, your magnificence. We, 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 just, it, we need to sit and, and ponder and just let this thing simmer. But God, I, I, you know... I just pray that you in some way make this thing just sink in and help us to just grab hold of the significance of this image that Ezekiel was able to see and is portrayed through these words that we read. And, and the Bible. Lord, beyond all that, we, we realize just what a powerful God you are and how jealous you are for us. That, that, that we would be in a relationship with you that is tender, that is real. And I am so grateful today, God, that we're able to do that through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is in His name we pray. Amen.